He had money and fame. I had a yacht in the south of France and people listened to every word that I said. But then the stock market dropped. I lost uh, everything. Find out what finally got him interested in God. Plus, Dr. Ajay Seth shares how his faith helped him make historical advances in bionic development. It's all on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. A school in Florida is getting mixed reactions after hiring two combat veterans to be security guards. After 17 people died in the Parkland massacre last year, legislators passed a law requiring Florida schools to have at least one safe school officer. The Manatee School for the Arts has taken it a step further. Their trained guards will carry rifles. Well, many were surprised by the school's choice of using long guns. If an armed intruder enters the campus, the school's principal says, we're not looking for a fair fight. We're looking for an overwhelming advantage. And uh, I would say in today's world, yes, I Absolutely. would want an overwhelming advantage. Yeah. And Given the number of school shootings, we've actually lost track and we measure now based on yeah. how many people were killed. And it, I, I like the fact that it's on the heels of what happened, it's an appropriate response, like not an argument over guns. It's like we, our kids are safe. And one thing about long guns is they know you have them. <laughs> you know, yeah. like. Well, the, you know, the, what was it, the bank robbers in LA that, that mm -hmm. you know, they had um, automatic weapons and the police had handguns and the police were outgunned and they yeah. couldn't stop them. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was overwhelming force meeting a police force. And so and how why not times? have overwhelming force yeah. on site ready to go? How many times have you seen automatic weapons in these shootings? It seems so, to be every time. Every yeah, time. Exactly. Well, the story of another officer is going viral. Six year old Levi Johnson was sworn into the Bellevue Police Department in Nebraska. Johnson wants to be a police officer when he grow, grows up, but he was born with three holes in his heart and hearing loss. Because of his health issues, it's unlikely that he'll be able to join active law enforcement as an adult. The Bellevue Police Department began a social media campaign to gather patches for him. Um, what's displayed on this table is just an outpouring of love from law enforcement agencies all across the world. You know what that means, right? You're a police officer now. Mm -hmm. This isn't something that we want to happen today for 15, 20 minutes. We want to welcome Levi and our family and know that he's welcome here. That is awesome. Well, some of the officers took badges straight off their uniforms because they wanted him to have one that has, quote, seen action. What a great thing for the police. To Amazing. That's a wonderful, yeah. Amazing, yeah. Well, dark winter months can cause seasonal depression, so the city of Copenhagen in Denmark decided to brighten up the night sky with a light festival. In this northern European country, the sun currently goes down at 5 p.m. and comes back up at 8 a.m. Add to that the cold temperatures averaging around 17 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a lot like Wisconsin. Yeah, <laughs> the month-long <peeps. laughs> <the> month <laughs> light festival is a welcome reminder that spring is coming eventually. I think the light festival gives people a head start of spring. In so many months it's been dark up here in the northern countries and, and we hunger for summer and spring. So this gives us a, yeah, a little head start of, of that spring feeling. Well, artists and performers from all over the world brought their talents to Copenhagen and more than 130,000 visitors have already been to see the city's laser and light show. And that's a great idea. Yes, it is a great idea. Yeah. Something to look forward to in the winter. I looked, I looked at my daffodils just coming up they a little bit. They are up. Yes. <laughs> so yes. I think I've got Copenhagen beat. But I, I actually almost drove off the road yesterday. As I, <laughs> I, I went, wait a minute. Those are flowers. In February. <laughs> in February. Who knew? We've had crazy weather here. Well, Joseph Kaplan's fortune earned him the nickname Midas, as he seemed to have the golden touch. But after the stock market crash of 1973, he went from eating caviar to facing jail time. And then someone asked him a question that would change his life. I had a yacht in the south of France, a 72-foot yacht with a crew. And uh, in those days, we would serve champagne and caviar and people listened to every word that I said. I absolutely loved it. 
Joseph Kaplan tells his captivating rags to riches story in his book, The Money Man. Born in London in 1931, Joseph entered his teens as World War II entered its final months. As a Jewish boy in Europe at the time, he experienced prejudice and sometimes hatred. At home, Joseph's beloved grandfather told him he could make something of himself, and Joseph believed him. Joseph, why as a young man did you want to be a barrister at law? I just had this great desire to defend people who couldn't defend themselves. I only began the career for a fairly short time, and then my father became ill, and it was necessary for me to go into his business, the rag trade. So you sacrificed your career for the family? Yes, I did. Did he express any gratitude? None at all. And that was one of the reasons why I was angry with him and resented him. He never ever said he loved me, and I didn't understand then that it's wrong to hate somebody. But I had got involved with business people. For the first time in my life, I had the taste of money. Joseph started lending money through a small Christmas club. He later became a banker, and within five years, he owned a finance company. So I set out to make money. And you were good at that. I was very successful. And my company was on the London Stock Exchange, and uh, I, I had become a multimillionaire. And the press called me Midas because they said everything I touched turned to gold. And there was a point of time when I had approximately 86 companies, and uh, I had 20 banking branches. What did that begin to feel like the more money you made? I liked the uh, fame, and I enjoyed the fact that people would look at me and say, he's made millions. It was something that mattered to me. Did you like who you were becoming? No, I didn't like myself at all, but I was very motivated. I saw and learned what people would do in order to make more money to the detriment of other people, and it meant nothing, and I became one of them. And one thing I can tell you about people who make money, it's never enough. The bottom fell out in 1973 when the London stock market took a nosedive, taking Joseph's company down with it. And my life was suddenly very, very different. I, I lost uh, everything. But, um, I, I had hardly any money. The British government later chased him down in America and charged Joseph with multiple business infractions, landing him in jail. What's it like to go from vacationing on a yacht, eating caviar, drinking champagne, to being in solitary confinement in prison? Well, it's dramatic, of course. It was an awful experience. I was uh, unable to talk to anybody, and meals were served through the slot. It's not something I would wish upon anybody, even if I didn't like them. Were you found guilty of any crimes? No. They found me not guilty of everything. Joseph didn't give God a thought when he was at the top, but that started to change when life got tough, and he and his wife Valerie were invited to a Bible study. Bible, and I listened very carefully, and something happened inside of me, and I said to myself, I need to know more about the Bible. And then a lady came up to me, Are you now ready, Joseph, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ? as your Messiah. And I burst into tears, and I'm not in any way embarrassed to say that. And I cried for about 10 minutes. And with her, I received the Lord Jesus. I repented of my sins. And what did receiving Christ in your heart do to satisfy you as compared to how the world and its riches could never do that? I lost all value for material things. What I wanted to do was to learn more and more about what God says to us in the Bible. Joseph learned much more and eventually became a pastor. Then in 1993, he lost his beloved Valerie to cancer. He later met and married Elaine. I do have to ask, was there any healing with your dad? Absolutely. The resentment that people have and sometimes hate has got to be abandoned. 
And the day came that I spoke to the Lord and I said, I was sorry about what I said about my father and I asked for forgiveness. For someone who currently now is in the pit where you were, I mean, you found yourself, you lost everything, you're in a prison cell, and they feel like they can't rebuild. They have no hope. What would you counsel them about the hope found in Christ? He says that he is going to dwell among his people, whatever their background may be, and whoever they may be, and whether they've made money or lost money. And there will be no more tears, and there will be no more fear, and there will be no more death. And this I live by. That is a poignant story, isn't Very it? Very poignant story to go from wow. riches to rags yeah. or riches to solitary and then have the question, are you ready mm -hmm. to meet your Messiah? I mean, that, yeah. And, and then for that, just that question to, to cause him to mm. burst into tears. Yeah. Um, sometimes God has to take us into very unusual pe places to get mm -hmm. our attention, yeah. to say, okay, uh, are you finally ready to follow me? Yeah. And then I've learned in my life, that's something that I need to do every day. You know, it's one thing to say, well, I've made a decision, but mm -hmm. you know, so often we can get further away from that decision. And, and that's why that call is there. Can you die today? Can we die daily? Take up his cross. Your cross is not his cross. Take up your cross and follow him. There's something so gentle and winsome about the way he expresses himself, but so powerful. You know, just a quiet, settled, it's settled. Well, that's, <laughs> the experience yes. led to that. Um, he wouldn't have had that same gentle spirit and nature if mm -hmm. he hadn't gone through what he'd gone through. Uh, first, to have a father who never says, I love you. Wow. Uh, never appreciates what, what you do. Mm -hmm. And then um, to go riches to solitary. Mm -hmm. And in that moment to say, okay, I found my Messiah. Purpose. Yeah. Mm. Well, still ahead, the story behind the bionic miracle. Hear how an unlikely doctor and a brave amputee made medical history. All that and more when we come back. In July of 2015, Melissa was walking her dogs. A few moments later, they were fighting with a raccoon, and a few moments after that, the raccoon sank its teeth into Melissa's wrist. That brief encounter resulted in a hospital stay, and before long, Melissa crossed paths with Dr. A.J. Seth, and soon the two made medical history. Dr. A.J. Seth's patient, Melissa Loomis, lost part of her arm due to a monster infection that almost took her life. Getting someone to move their arm had been done maybe 100, 150 times in the world. They said, you want to do something cool, get her to feel her prosthetic hand. In his book, Rewired, Dr. Seth shares how he and Melissa made medical history when the surgery he performed on her changed the future of amputees forever. Well, Dr. Seth is with us now, and this seems like something out of a science fiction movie, that you, you actually have someone mentally controlling an arm, and that arm doesn't even have to be attached to their body. Um, that just seems bizarre. It's almost Star Wars-like. They say, <laughs> um, you know, the, the arm that you see is, is one that is at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and it was made for a military male, 200 pounds. My patient's about 100 pounds but it's really the only arm in the world that can move and feel, and we were blessed to be able to do research with them. And when my patient Melissa is, um, we're able to go there, it's like she lives two, three days of her previous life with both arms, because she can do everything with that arm, move every finger, she can pinch, she can move the elbow, and she can feel that prosthetic hand. All right, well, take us back to the time where you met Melissa, and at that point, you actually thought she was a very special patient. Why? You know, I met her as a, uh, just a regular consultation. Um, she had an infection that was, uh, what I would assume was just like every other infection I've seen. And they had talked about, do we stay in this small community hospital? Uh, because her infection had kept getting worse, or, or do we go somewhere else? And for some reason, I just 
felt like I was the one who needed to take care of her. And I remember them asking me, like, is she going to lose her arm? And, and I said, there's no way. Mm. I was like, I've never had a patient lose an arm from an infection. Well, fast forward, I didn't realize how bad this was going to get. And whatever I could do in my power, I wasn't able to stop her from being septic, even though we did 13 surgeries over and over again to wash the bacteria out. I wasn't able to prevent her from becoming septic and almost dying. Well, a lot of people don't know what septic yeah. sepsis is, so you're talking about a blood infection, right? Yeah, so an easy way to think of sepsis, I, was, uh, I say it's like uh, in her arm, the bacteria jumped on a train, mm -hmm. and all the arteries and veins, which kind of pump blood, they, the train goes down those arteries, and it uses the liver or the kidneys as train stops, where the bacteria will just jump off the train, and it started hitting her kidney, and it was a war in, in her kidneys. And then it went to her liver and started causing a war there. So all her blood work showing that her liver was shutting down, her kidneys were shutting down, and, and she was, you know, they said within hours of dying. And so you had to amputate. You had to get rid of the source of the infection. Correct. Which was the arm. Correct. Um, what got you to the point where you're saying, okay, she can, she, she's unique enough mm -hmm. that we can try this special prosthetic? Yeah. When I made that promise to her, because I promised her she wouldn't lose her arm, and I had to do the amputation, I felt like I let her down. And, you know, as a surgeon, you don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. And she asked about a prosthetic, and she showed me a video on social media that was super advanced. And I said, Melissa, I'll make you the most advanced amputee the world's ever had. And again, just making another promise. And I was like, wow, that's a pretty big promise. Well, that's what gave me kind of the fire to do this surgery um, and, and the first in the U.S. to try to let someone feel and move a prosthetic hand. And it was a 16-hour surgery done with a phenomenal staff in a community hospital. You know, I just happened to be the captain of the ship, but every one of those people made this possible. Well, here's where the... Science fiction <laughs> comes real. How do you get sensation from something artificial going through a neuron to a brain? How does that happen? Right. The body is like a two-way highway. There are nerves that go from the brain to your fingertip that make it move. But then there's another nerve that goes backwards that tells you what you're feeling. So if there's a fire, you touch the fire, it sends an impulse, hot, your brain says, move your hand, it goes back and moves your hand. What I did was, think of it as speaker wire, her speaker was removed, but there's still impulse or you know, music going through. Mm -hmm. I just found the one little nerve in a conglomeration of nerves and just took it and moved it to a new area. So her brain would think her hand is still there and moved and we moved it to the inside of her arm. And Hence the name of the book, Rewired, because we never, I didn't implant anything in the body. I just use what God gave you, you know, the brain and the body, just kind of well, rewired it. Well, I still have it. to ask the question, okay, you moved it so to the inside moved. of her arm. Right. How does the inside of her arm right. get any kind of sensation from something across a room? Right. So if you pressed on the prosthetic thumb, mm -hmm. and I put a sensor on your thumb, just a vibratory sensor, I can have that sent Bluetooth, Wi-Fi anyway, and you'll feel it on your thumb. Same thing with her. We had the prosthetic, which has little devices that then when they're pushed, they send a signal. That signal goes to a little skin sensor we put on her arm, mm -hmm. and it pushes on the nerve like you would push on your thumb, and she says, oh, that's my thumb. So everything is basically done through technology up until it gets to the human body, where she's no different than you. And so... Does neuroplasticity play a role where the brain is actually relearning sensations that are coming from that nerve? I think it's re it, it is relearning because at the beginning, she could just feel. And then she could feel pain. And then she could feel cold. And then she could feel hot. And now when she takes a shower, she tells us that her hand goes warm. If she's in a cold room, we just did a speaking engagement. She's like, oh, my hand is really cold. So her brain at this point 
has changed to think that she's regrown an arm. And the prosthetic that you see um, and her native arm, they move at the exact same rate now. Um, so it's, it's kind of a relearning process, but in addition, it is just, you know, almost tricking the brain into thinking there's something there that's not. And you're just using a different impulse. It's all you're doing. To do that. Exactly. Um, it, it, I assume there's something in the work for Melissa that is less weight for her. There, <laughs> At least uh, I hope there, there is. isn't. There isn't. No. No. And what I have kind of put it as my goal is, is that I don't want to stop it at this point. You know, when she felt, I thought we were on the peak of the mountain mm -hmm. and we weren't. We're almost at base camp because yes, those five days she lived this life that was great, but there's nothing out there because she's so far ahead of technology. What her and I have said how now do is to, to obtain funding, either philanthropy wise, someone who wants to really make a difference for wounded warriors, because we know how to make this her size. We know how to make it so that she can utilize it. People can utilize it, lower the costs, and then it'll come mainstream. But, I'm surprised uh, there aren't investors interested because this is an absolute game changer for amputees. Right. I, I think the, the biggest hurdle we've had to overcome is I live in a town of 17,000 people. And when people hear that this is done, they don't think it could be done in a community hospital. There's no way advancement in science can come out of there. Well, that's the brilliance of it. And, and, and that means it's now right scalable. Right. And so it's trying to get the word out. You know, and every show we go on, just like, you know, here, we're blessed because we're trying to spread the word. How, mu and, how much money are you talking about? You know, what we've kind of come up with, with the whole staff, we were looking, we think with a couple million dollars, we can really get this advanced to the point where we can try it on 10 wounded warriors. You know, we kind of came up with a budget, but you know, the hard thing is I still practice orthopedics. I still see patients every day. I still do surgeries. And at nighttime in my house, that's where I work on this. So in order to really advance it, I want to, you know. Don't tell just, me you got a basement. <laughs> it is in the basement. <laughs> you got a basement. But lab. I have a basement with, with a 16 year old kid <laughs> who wants to push everything aside so that friends can play. But, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, we've kind of made a budget and I really think that with, you know, we came up, you know, four million, three million, um, we can get it done. And, and I know in the country, there's so many people who do philanthropy and stuff. And we're just hoping that, you know, God opens the door and one day somebody comes and says, hey, you know, make this, uh, make this happen. And I know we can. All right. Well, if you heard the call, uh, he's asking for God to open the door. And if you want to find out more, the book is called Rewired. It's available in stores nationwide. And Congratulations Thank to you, you and best you wishes. Very may may this come may the funding come quickly for you. I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Terry, over to you. Well, we're gonna take some time to pray for you after the break, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to the show. We want to take some time to pray for the needs of you, our viewers, and you can send your prayer requests to our Facebook or Instagram. Our team is ready to pray for you always. This is from Linda. She says, please pray for my husband to be healed from pulmonary pulmonary fibrosis. And then Barb says, I had a hip surgery and I'm having trouble with my legs. Please pray God will loosen the muscles and give me strength. Well, we also have a praise report from Bonnie who says, God gave me two miracles. God healed my right arm and I no longer need a walker. And that is wonderful. Praise God. Let's just pray right now. If you have a need, uh, just in an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. If you don't have any needs, join with us. And let's, let's claim two verses. One, when two or more agree, touching anything, it shall be done. So we've got Terry, we've got me, we've got you. And then we've got a big viewing audience. And then another verse, when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So Jesus is saying, yes, I will show up. In him we live and move and have our being. But he says something special. When we're gathered in his name, he's there in the midst. So if Jesus is here, we have all we need. He's the healer. All we have to do is look to him He's the author, the finisher of our faith. So let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you. We lift these two prayer requests that have come in from Linda and from Barb. 
And we just lay hands on the request. We lay hands together with those who are watching right now and laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing. We come into agreement now and we say, be healed and be every bit whole. Let all pain, all discomfort, all disease, all cancer, all inflammation, all infirmity leave now in Jesus name. Um, this is unusual. And there's someone you've got a rib cage sternum problem uh, from open heart surgery where your bone was cut and it hasn't healed together properly. God is able to restore bone. He's able to knit it together properly. And you just felt that go into your sternum. You're healed now. Take a big breath and realize everything has been restored. Well, surely whatever it is you're praying for, God's answer to you today is yes. And BJ, you're wondering, is what's happening here really real? And I believe God has mentioned your name today just for you to know, yes, he sees you, he knows you, his hand is upon you. Amen. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from the Bible from Psalms. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. <laughs> 